Welcome back to the Super Mario Marathon. It's been a long time coming, but finally we're here in 16-bit territory. The Super Nintendo is definitely one of my favorite consoles, and it has so many of my favorite games on it. Super Mario World definitely being no exception. Though if I'm being honest, I always go back to Mario 3 first. With Mario World, typically I'll get to Vanilla Dome, decide, okay, that's good enough, put the game down for a few months, and never go back to it eventually. I don't know why that is, but I really felt it this time around. Uh, maybe it's on Burned Out because I just played six Mario games beforehand, but taking breaks in between the worlds really helped with stagnation. That aside though, thank you for joining me to this vacation in Dinosaur Land. This is Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. While I'm not sure why this game isn't called Super Mario Bros. 4, I can say the title fits in some regard. We aren't in the Mushroom Kingdom anymore. Instead, the location of this game is Dinosaur Land, a massive island in the southern Mushroom Sea. Although if I'm being honest with you guys, Super Mario World honestly fits Mario 3 a bit more, seeing as how in that game, Mario is traveling the entire Mushroom World, you know, going from kingdom to kingdom, but I digress. The story here is that, deciding they've had enough of Bowser's antics, Mario, Luigi, and Princess Toadstool head by balloon to the nearby dinosaur land for vacation. The bros return to a course, find out... Bowser kidnapped Peach! Uh, the GBA version does a much better job in terms of storytelling. In the original version, you just start the game and this awkward text box appears, and then you're off to explore. Can you imagine if modern Mario games still followed this? What if in Odyssey it didn't have that opening cutscene and just dropped Mario into the Cap Kingdom with a flat text box like, Hey, Bowser kidnapped Peach. Lol, you better go stop him. The first part of your journey is Yoshi's Island, where they meet Yoshi, who was trapped in an egg by Bowser's minions. Yoshi was on his own quest to save his captured friends, who were also turned into eggs. So together, Mario, Luigi, and Yoshi team up to stop Bowser. I love Yoshi, but something I love more is this game. Right off the bat, I just want to praise how this game looks, and the graphics, they're just so Super Nintendo to me, you know what I mean? The little lines in the ocean simulating waves, the way the clouds move on the world map, the little fish that always jumps out when you cross the bridge, and many more little details makes me love the look of this place. Mario's sprite has seen another change, and while I was really fond of how he looked in this last adventure, this sprite is iconic. You are lying to me. If you say you have never seen this sprite in all kinds of YouTube animations, both good or bad. Luigi does not get his own sprite, and that is supremely lazy to me. I can understand why it was like that back on NES, but this is a new console with new capabilities! Never before has it been more obvious that it's just Mario wearing green clothes. Look at him. I do not see Luigi here. Thankfully though, the Super Mario All-Stars re-release of this game decked out Luigi with his own look that, again, has also been featured in many YouTube videos. Strangely enough though, when Luigi gets a fire flower here, it looks like he's spitting the fire out of his mouth, which always bugged me. Did he get tips from a fire bro or something? Speaking of fire flowers, let's talk about power-ups. You got your returning veterans, mushrooms, and star man, and the fire flower, which I think is my favorite iteration of this thing. I love its tulip design, with the orange and the green color scheme. I think it's really unique compared to all the rest of them. I really love the deep, vibrant red that Fire Mario and the Koopa Shells are sporting here. Again, this game just nails it in terms of visually appealing sprites and colors. Back on power-ups though, there's two new ones this time around, being the Cape Feather and the Magic Balloon! The Cape Feather lets you slow your fall, it gives you an awesome, super spammable cape attack, which would go on to become Mario's side special on Smash Brothers, and with enough speed, you can take up to the skies and fly with clever finessing of the D-pad. The Magic Balloon is very situational and is only used in a handful of levels. It's not really a real power-up in terms of enhancing Mario's pre-existing moveset. It's really just a situational gimmick. But anyway, you've all heard it before, the Cape Feather can break this game in two. Don't feel like playing this level? Just get a stretch of land and fly over everything. It isn't hard to abuse. And this can make the Fire Flower feel obsolete. Sure, hitting enemies with Fire Flowers in this game turns them into coins, but... It's really outshined here by the Cape Feather, which I feel like the game designers tried to counteract by giving you Fire Flowers more often than Cape Feathers, but that also falls short considering this game's improved map structure. Just like Mario 3, you have a world map to explore, and this place is huge! 
Levels are dictated by these yellow spots on the board, and if they're red, that means that level contains a hidden exit that pops up on an alternate path for you to take, or it gives you access to a secret level. Why hasn't the theming of yellow and red come back in newer games? It's so much more visually appealing, I love it! But back onto the power-ups like I was saying, in this game, any level you've already beaten, if you hit start and select, you can just leave the level no matter where you are, even if you're about to die. You get to keep any and all power-ups you get, even if you don't actually finish the level. The levels themselves, though, are a huge step up from 3. They're bigger, denser, more secret areas with bonus rooms, and they're all longer with checkpoints symbolized by breaking tape. And of course, almost every level ends with that classic end level jingle. I love that peace sign, and Luigi has his own little pose as well. Accompanying the levels is the music. Oh, the music. It's so wonderful. While they all follow the same basic melody, they're changed in a way that allows each one to stand on their own. The plains theme is uplifting and gets you an adventurous mood. The underground theme is mysterious and atmospheric. The athletic theme makes you never want to stop moving. And the underwater theme, it's calm and serene. Each song also gets a huge boost when you're riding Yoshi with an added pair of bongo drums. But I'd be doing a disservice by leaving out the most chilling of all. New to this game are ghost houses, challenging levels that you'll need a brain to get through. They aren't as simple as getting to the goal, usually you'll have to solve some kind of puzzle. The music here is shared with the returning castle levels, but with some added scary effects. Inside these castles are the returning seven Koopalanes, who are just about as challenging as they were in 3. There's also the optional fortress levels that all end with a battle with Reznor! these four dinosaurs that spit fireballs. Since I brought up the bosses, why not discuss the enemies? Here, there's mostly the same faces that you've come to know. Koopas, Bullet Bills, Cheep Cheeps, Piranha Plants, the usual suspects. Joining us, though, are Galoombas. Not Goombas, Galoombas. They can't be jumped on, but instead, they're picked up and tossed around. There's charging trucks, which are some confused assholes. I mean, you find these guys dashing into you, kicking footballs, throwing baseballs, calling in more enemies, and even splitting into three copies. There's bonsai bills, rexes, which require two stomps, many ghost types, the amazing flying hammer bro, and many more. Surprisingly though, for a world called Dinosaur Land, there's only about three dinosaur-themed enemies, with Rex and the two variants of the Dino Rhino. Switching gears to the topic of control, I have a few things to say. Remember how I said Mario's movement in 3 was very finely tuned and perfect to play with? Well, World takes that and improves it, though not in a huge way. You have better ground speed, much more control of your aerial movement and general momentum, and with the advent of the Super Nintendo controller, you can now run and hurl fireballs at the same time. We've got four buttons now, and Nintendo wanted you to use them. Well, I think the Mario controls just fine here. I actually think he controls too fine. Let me explain. You see, Mario controls so well here, I actually find myself getting carried away with all the freedom of movement, and that leads to some deaths I could have very easily avoided. While it's true that I can pull off riskier jumps and mid-air stuff that I wouldn't dare try in Mario 3, I really think he's kind of slippery here. And the few times this game tries ice levels, ugh, don't even bother. The physics are shoddy at best, very frustrating to deal with at worst. I don't like it. Though I will say, Mario's angle animation for these levels is very funny to me. Added to Mario's repertoire of moves is the new spin jump, and god I love this thing. It's almost like a power-up by itself. It lets you instantly defeat almost every enemy, you get great height off of enemies you jump off of, and when you're big, you can break certain blocks with it. I know I complimented it in my Super Mario Land 2 video, but man I really love this ability. You'll be using all of your abilities to get through the worlds of this game though, and they aren't as conventional as say Mario 3. You got Yoshi's Island, Donut Plains, Vanilla Dome, the Butter and Cheese Bridge area, the Forest of Illusion, Chocolate Island, and finally the Valley of Bowser. Defeating the Koopalings and rescuing Yoshi's trapped friends, Mario, Luigi, and Yoshi find themselves at Bowser's Coney Island Disco Palace. Inside his castle are various trap rooms that you have to progress if you want to make your way deeper inside. Alternatively though, if you don't want to deal with all that, you can beat the Valley Fortress and gain access to the back door of his castle, which is really funny. 
for world building reasons. Like, of course Bowser would build a back door just so his minions could come and go. Going through the back door, you skip to the midway point of his castle, dodging lava pits, the dark, and the new Mecha Koopa enemies. But very soon, you walk through that red door and... There are only a few bosses in video games that I think have such a perfect buildup, and this one certainly blew my young mind. The fight with Bowser takes place on the roof of his castle. There's lightning and thunder billowing in the background, and the stakes are high. Bowser flying around in his new, albeit silly, Koopa clown car, hurling down Mecha Koopas, which you have to use to pick him up and launch him on his head. Two hits and he flies away, but it's not over. He comes flying directly into the screen, spits fire at you, then the princess comes out and gives you a mushroom to help before getting subdued. Repeat this two more times, Bowser's KO'd and the princess is saved. Once all is said and done, you make it back to Yoshi's Island, the eggs hatch, and the credits roll. And I'm not joking when I say the credits theme for this game is one of my favorite pieces of music in all of video games. Super Mario World was a huge success, especially seeing as how it was bundled with the Super Nintendo, making it the highest selling game of that console. But for all the things this game does well, and all the things I love about it, I feel like it presents a bit of a serious stagnation. Shigeru Miyamoto famously holds this game as the golden standard of Mario making sure that almost all games to come would adhere to its style and formula, never really wanting to branch out. I'm glad that with new devs on the team, we were able to get games like Super Mario Odyssey and Escape Miyamoto's Grasp, but the RPGs and other spin-off games, they seem to still adhere to these extremely strict guidelines, which is a shame. It's kind of sad if you think about it. The man who made all these great things is now the one holding them back, and I think that the fact of the matter is, we're not going to get truly experimental games like this one, at least not until after that man passes away, which is tragic, but ultimately, I think it's the truth. That aside though, uh, let's get back to the game, which itself still has many things to do. As many of you may have noticed, throughout the worlds are these star paths. You hover over it. Star Road, what's that? World 8, Star World! Inside Star World are five levels, with two exits each that form a path that lets you take shortcuts to later worlds. Inside Star World's levels are different colored baby Yoshis, which is one of my absolute favorite aspects of this game, Yoshi and his abilities. Yoshi has a strange relationship with Koopa Troopas. The color of their shell will give him various abilities when swallowed. If he grabs just a plain old green shell, he'll spit it out like a projectile. It takes a red shell though, it lets you spit out fireballs. A yellow shell, it gives you a little ground stomp that defeats all enemies in its admittedly very small range. And the most rare of all shells, the blue shell, gives Yoshi wings. The different colored Yoshis retain these abilities, no matter the color of the shell they eat. Red Yoshi will shoot fire, yellow Yoshi does the stomp attack, and blue Yoshi sprouts wings. Yoshi's pretty awesome and is my favorite addition to this game, and believe it or not, was planned to be in the very original Super Mario Brothers, but couldn't be added due to technical limitations. Beating every level in Star World unlocks another Star Road. You take that one and BAM! You're in the ninth world, the Special Zone! In this area are some totally radical names and the hardest challenges yet. In order to conquer the Special Zone, you gotta make your way through gnarly, too weird, way through, awesome, groovy, mondo, it's outrageous, and fucking. In the first level, gnarly, you get a text box that tells you about another new world that's unlocked by beating the Special Zone, and that just motivates you to keep going and beat it. Once you finally do, you take that last star road, and what do you find? The entire overworld has been changed from spring to autumn. This even extends to the Valley of Bowser, the Vanilla Dome, and even Star World, and I love the revamped color palette. Chocolate Island also becomes mint chocolate, which I am totally down for. Not only did the season change, but also some of the enemies. Koopa Troopas become mass Koopas and wear silly Mario heads. Piranha Plants become jack-o'-lanterns, and Bullet Bills become Pidgeys. Though I do find it a missed opportunity that in subsequent re-releases of this game, they didn't change more of the enemies. In my opinion, 
This reward is pretty cool, and it's something I wish later games would also do. In the GBA version, the only thing they changed is that Galoombas now wear sunglasses. But they should have gone all out and given makeovers to every enemy. Beating Bowser one more time shows us all the changed enemies in the roll call section of the ending. This finally lets you know. You've beaten Bowser, you've found all 96 exits, you beat every level, conquered every boss, tamed the star world, and turned your back to the special zone. You have truly mastered Super Mario World. Is it over? Did I do it? I finally reviewed the entire original series! I'm done with the Mario Marathon! Kind of, anyway! There's still two more games on the Super Nintendo for me to look at, being Yoshi's Island and Super Mario RPG. But really, I feel like this marathon has come to a nice conclusion. But if you really want me to take a look at those two games, I will. I'll leave a link to a straw poll that you can vote on in the description, and I'll set up a YouTube poll using the community tab. So hopefully, more than 10 of you will see this video and vote in the poll. It seems like YouTube has not been really giving me any exposure lately. They're not recommending my videos to people, even if you're watching my video right now. Do me a favor, look in the recommended tab, wherever it is. Do you see any of my videos there? I didn't think so! So it's with a heavy heart that I have to succumb to the algorithm and say, please, won't you turn on that notification bell so that you actually get notified when I upload because it seems like YouTube doesn't want to do its job. I thought that was why we had a subscription box anyway, but I guess it doesn't matter anymore. But since I'm on the topic of YouTube here, if you want more unscripted content from yours truly, kind of what I'm doing right now, you can always head over to my second channel, Whalen Plays a Game. It's here that I upload Let's Plays, I play games with my friends, and of course, I post my reviews there. So if you want to support the show, support me and what I do, you can subscribe to that channel. I think you'll find it to be fairly entertaining. But, on the topic of the Mario Marathon concluding or finishing, I'll see you guys next time with a new subject matter, or I'll be finishing the Super Nintendo, wrapping those games up. So, if you really want to take a look at those games, or if you want me to move on, get voting! Vote like your life depends on it. So, in the meantime, my name is Waylon, but I'm fairly certain you knew that already. Do me a favor, and stick around for more. This video was made possible thanks to excellent patrons like Head Punch. Please consider supporting me on Patreon to get early access to videos, patron-only streams, special Discord roles, and influence on future videos. Lowest tier starts at only $1. Thank you for supporting the show!